Today, I am going to talk to you about that which killed the cat um, and share with you 10 life hacks from the research and evaluation professions. Um, professions where we spend day in and day out asking why. And so I'd like to share some of the principles from the way we work with you. So I'm Dr. Melody Mintz, as you've heard, and around three years ago, I started an independent company that focuses on providing research and evaluation services to individuals, to companies, to universities, and to NGOs in South Africa and more broadly in the continent. Um, in a past life, I was not only a proud COPSI alumni, but I spent around eight years working on campus, firstly as the secretary to the director of research, eventually as a research assistant, a lecturer in research methods, and then ultimately as the research coordinator at the Center for Teaching and Learning. Now, when I came to university, I had every ambition to become a prolific clinical psychologist cracking the most devious criminal minds, and having my clients greet me with a, well, hello, Melody, <laughs> in their best Hannibal Lecter voices. Um, and somewhere along the way, I fell in love with research. And as all true love stories go, the rest is history in the making. So when people ask me at dinner parties, what do you do for a living? I give them my eloquently rehearsed 15 second elevator speech, and I get one of two reactions. The first is, what? And the second is, why would you want to do that every single day? Um, because typically when people talk about research or when students have to take a research methods class, I hear, it's boring, it's complicated, it's difficult, I can't do it. It has no purpose. Um, and so I'm not trying to contest that it may be boring, it may be difficult, it may be complicated, but the reason why I am passionate every single day about asking why, about doing research and evaluation is because for me, it's a window of opportunity to make a difference. Um, so all of us, and I believe that every human being has a responsibility to in some way contribute positively to creating a world we would all be proud of living in. And for me, being a research and an evaluation consultant is a window of opportunity to have a voice and to make a difference um, in the various projects that I get involved with. So what actually do we do? I mean, what does it mean to be a researcher and an evaluator? Um, and you'll see two intersecting circles. Um, without going into many details and touching on touchy debates in the field, research and evaluation are two distinct activities, but with strong overlap. So you can have research that's not evaluative, and you can have evaluations that don't involve research. But most of the work that we do lies at the intersection of these two areas. So we use research methods and principles to do evaluation work. Um, and just really quickly, the differences between evaluation and research lie primarily in the angle which you're coming from. So researchers are asking questions of interest to them. They are seeking to make a contribution in the knowledge field. Um, and the value and the quality of their work is judged within the academic community. Evaluation, on the other hand, 
is typically commissioned by somebody who's interested in finding out if something is working and why it's working. And so, as an evaluator, we look at the design, the implementation, the impact and the sustainability of various projects, initiatives, programs, policies, and we look at, is it working? And is it not working? And what makes it work? Right, so that's, in a nutshell, what we do. Now, when you begin an evaluation, you have to start getting information to see if something's working or if it's not. And you have to get information from multiple perspectives and from multiple sources. So in a typical project, it would not be uncommon to have at least 30 or 40 documents to read, a couple of surveys that are done, a few focus groups, a few interviews, and all of this information has to get processed, and all of this information has to somehow come together and tell you it's working or it's not. And in order to do that, we use frameworks to help us understand. And one of my favorite frameworks falls over three spheres. And I'm going to touch on this quickly, because I want to bring it in later with my life hacks. The first is the sphere of control. This is the sphere where you, as a person, or an organization that has a project, can make a direct contribution. Right? It's completely within your control, and you can be held accountable. So if I were to start a project at a school to give out apples so that we don't have to keep the doctor so busy, I can source apples and hand them out at school, right? That's directly in my control to do. But then, in the sphere of influence, I can't force people to eat my apples. So my influence becomes less and my be control becomes less because now people have to respond to what I'm doing. And ultimately, we have the sphere of interest that which we wish would change. In other words, fewer visits to the doctor. So I've made a contribution. I'm hoping to have influence, but I can't necessarily control the outcome or the ultimate goal. And these frameworks help us understand evaluations and help us see what could work and what was out of the control of the program. But now, before you think that I'm trying to convince you either to be an evaluator or go into a lot of evaluation speak, I move on to the reason that I actually came here today. To share with you 10 life hacks from the professions of research and evaluation for successful curiosity. And I believe that by applying these life hacks, even if you are not in the fields of research or evaluation, they will enable you to make a positive difference in the places, communities, and spaces you find yourselves. Typical to my nature, I couldn't just say I'm going to share a life hack. I had to go and be curious and figure out what exactly is a life hack? Where did this idea come from? I mean, life hack, life hack, life hack. We hear the word a lot. But where did it come from? So there was a guy by the name of Danny O'Brien. And he had to give a talk on the tech secrets of over-prolific alpha geeks at a conference. And he was clueless. He was describing himself as the most unorganized person. He had a to-do list with over 159 items. The one item had been on his list for more than 15 years, and he was supposed to give a talk to a bunch of techies on how to be efficient and successful, which he felt really incapable of doing. So he started a blog, and he asked successful techies to give their secrets to him. How do you do it? How do you work better, simpler, faster? And 
He presented that at the conference, and that is where, in 2003, the concept of a life hack was initiated. By 2005, life hack was included as a word in the Urban Dictionary, and it has evolved from a tech-specific term to something in our everyday lives. Um, currently, there are more than 1.5 million results on YouTube for life hacks. Um, you could spend the rest of your life trying to life hack yourself and not get very far. But I digress. Um, in the words of the sunscreen song, I shall now dispense my advice. The first life hack from evaluation is that you should seek to understand why and not only what. As you observe the world around you, you see many things. Some things you're happy with, some things you're not happy with, some things you want to change. That's the what. It's what's out there. But my challenge to you is start to ask why. Why are things the way that they are? Why does this situation play out in the way that it does? And then start to constantly interrogate. Don't settle for a simple answer, and don't assume that the first answer you come up with is the right one. Um, but seek to understand why things are the way they are, rather than only what is. The second life hack is that you need to be clear about what you want to know. Because as soon as you become curious, there's the temptation to find an awesomely interesting thing, and then one awesomely interesting thing leads to another, and then that leads to another, and another, and you were trying to go in that direction, but somehow you ended up there. Um, so focus, focusing on what it is that you want to investigate, what it is that you want to understand, is really important um, to prevent you from going down the rabbit hole. But then once you've decided, you need to be creative about what can be done and what you would like to achieve. Every profession has an Achilles heel. Um, and people that do research, typically, we like to stick with the way we know how to do things. So I tried this method, this method works, and now I just always do the same method. Um, so I want to challenge you to set your mind free, to be creative, to be innovative in the way that you investigate and in the way that you ask why. Um, it was Albert Einstein who said that creativity is intelligence having fun. Um, so allow yourself to have intellectual fun when you're seeking to ask and answer the question why. Now, as I mentioned, we typically get masses of information when we're doing evaluation and research projects. And Human brains are amazing things, but they also have limitations. To avoid complete overload, our brains categorize. They put things in boxes. They want to group and want to make things simpler. So when you get this information overload, the temptation is to go and say, right, too much? I'm going with a simple A leads to B which we know is hardly ever the case in the real world. Then the pendulum swings to the other side, and we end up making our explanations so complicated that they really don't contribute much to understanding. Um, and so the fourth life hack is to avoid oversimplification and to stop making everything so complicated. Right, this balance, as you see in the beautiful mandala, is possible. 
clearly from the mandala, you can see the form of a circle. So the simple part of the picture is there. But when you zoom in deeper, we can see the incredible flow and the incredible detail that is in the mandala. Um, and that balance between complexity and simplicity is what you should seek. Um, it's not easy. It will take practice. Um, but it's worth developing the skill to be able to do this. And I come back now in life hack number five to my frameworks for understanding. The sphere of interest, right? You need to ask yourself, what, what do you really care about changing in the world? If you could imagine, like I said earlier, a world that everybody could be proud to live in, what would that world look like? And what would you need to change for that world to come about? That's your sphere of interest. The big dream out there um, that you want to make a difference to. For me, one of my favorite passions um, is obviously, as was mentioned, the cause of women, for obvious reasons. Um, but particularly, I am truly convinced that the empowerment of women in Africa is the critical key to food security on the continent um, for various reasons, and I'd love to chat to everyone about them afterwards, but uh, that's my thing. Um, and I'm fantastically privileged to work on a project that really focuses on doing this. At the same time, I realize there is no ways that I can reach every single woman on the continent and that I solely am going to help food security. So your sphere of influence encourages you to keep your head in the clouds, keep the sphere of interest in mind, but keep your feet on the ground. Keep a realistic perspective of what you're able to do. And then concentrate your energies on your sphere of control. Right, so the things that matter, your sphere of interest, intersects with the things that you can realistically do. And that intersection is where you really need to put your energies in, because that then helps you to contribute to the big dream and to your sphere of interest. Um, so for me, working with the African Women in Agricultural Research and Development Project is a wonderful opportunity um, to work in the areas of training women to be excellent researchers and excellent leaders um, that are going to make a difference to food security on the continent. You need to be on the lookout for unintended consequences. Um, and I want to give you just a few seconds to look at the picture. Sometimes, even when you're doing a positive action, it's going to have a domino effect and come back around to you. Um, and so, when you do something, always be on the lookout for what you didn't anticipate. Um, and this can be a good thing, as was in the case with the discovery of penicillin. Um, so keep focus, but keep an open mind. The ninth life hack is that you have to learn to bounce back. Because sometimes, even when you have the best plan, things go bang. Um, there's theory and how things should work. And then there's real life. Um, so always remain resilient. And the final is that you should take feedback seriously, but never personally. Initially, when I started out, I was so excited when a client sent a report back and they had nothing to say about it. That, for me, was the ultimate success. 
Now, I'm kind of disappointed if people don't engage with me, if they don't give me feedback, if they don't help me improve. Um, so, always take feedback seriously, but remember, it's not personal. And so, I conclude by asking you the question, why not be constantly curious? Why not continue asking why? And why not apply these principles in your life um, for improved excitement, but also as a way to make a difference um, in the world around you? So may your paths be blessed with fantastic, curious experiences. May you be fascinated by what you find. And thank you for the opportunity to tickle your curiosity.